The Argonauts. Picture in your mind the rocky hillside of a New England farm in the springtime of the year 1848. A clear-eyed, sturdy young man, his cheeks aglow with health, his hands to the plow, is breaking the stubborn glebe for the seed time of hope. And all there is to his hope is that when comes the harvest in the golden autumn, his household in the little farmhouse yonder may face the coming of the always rigorous winter with sufficient fare and perhaps a few scant hard-earned dollars. The young plowman is following in the footsteps of his father before him, and his father's father, through many generations of hard, wholesome, honest, yet unremunerative toil. To the young man, the attainment of wealth, and especially its sudden attainment, has been a dream with which to pass an evening by the fireside reading of Aladdin and his lamp or another tale as wonderful. Picture now the young man lifting his head from his toil to answer the hailing shout of a neighbor who has come from the nearby village and is approaching the stony hillside, flaunting excitedly in his hand a newspaper fresh from the mail bag of the village post office. The plowman halts his team and wonderingly awaits his neighbor, who comes on a pace quite breathless with some visible and strong excitement. Soon the two men are standing face to face, the newspaper trembles in their hands, and now with heads together they read with glowing eyes the thrill of the announcement that gold has been discovered in faraway California. Perhaps the furrow in that stony hillside field was never finished by the hand that began it in dull hope and apathy of spirits at the dawn of that springtime morning. Perhaps the team was left standing till fell the shades of night as these two friends fed themselves to the full on the dream of that golden land that awaited for their coming in a golden clime. They thrilled with the thought that they might, in one thrilling adventure, cross the sunlit plains, or set forth by sea around the horn, throw off their heritage of poverty, and clothe themselves in the raiment of kings. Not only to the stony hillside farms of New England, but to all the farms of the Atlantic seaboard, to the shops, the mills, the counting houses, and the schools of that region, and farther still, to every region of the whole civilized world, spread the news of the discovery of gold in California in that memorable springtime of 1848. By every fireside and on every spot where men gathered all together, from lip to lip was passed the tale that in the shining streams of the new El Dorado on the shores of the Sunset Sea, gold dust and gold nuggets lay almost as plentiful as the sands themselves. And the tale was true, never before in history and never since was so much gold gathered in so short a time by so many men who were, the year before, and all their lives before, the slaves of poverty as was gathered by those who participated in the gold rush of 1849. These men came to be called the Argonauts. Like Jason of old, they went in search of the Golden Fleece, and they found it. No such days as these were ever known before, nor shall the like of them be known again. Even though virgin gold fields equal in wealth to the virgin gold fields of California were to be discovered in these days or in days to come, the railroads, the telegraph, the ocean greyhounds, the automobile, and not unlikely the airship would rob the opportunity of the romance and glamour that cling to the days of 49 in California. Moreover, if a discovery of this nature were to be made in these times, the wealth which the discovery represented would be seized upon by syndicates and other combinations of capital before the discovery was a week old. Poor men in large numbers had their great day in California during the years that followed the finding of the first gold nugget on the American River in 1848. It is a day that is past and cannot come again. No doubt many poor men will become rich men in times to be, but it will not happen in the way that it happened when the Argonauts sailed the sea and the transcontinental trails were thick with overland pioneers. With the passing of the people who made those days what they were, romance has shot its brightest arrow and ends with a sigh, the most fascinating tale it has ever told. Almost in the very footsteps of the first Franciscan missionaries, American white men began to drift into California. It is certain, at least, that they made their appearance there soon after the Revolutionary War. But it is true that their numbers were very small during several generations. A New England trading schooner would now and then put into a California port to trade with the missions and the Indians, and occasionally leave behind it an adventurous passenger or a sailor who had wearied of the sea. From across the great Rockies came also now and then a wanderer upon some vague quest to find at last the land of heart's desire. 
So in this way, and that, there was quite a considerable number of American white men, as well as white men of other races than the Latin race, located in California in 1848. It is a strange fact to contemplate that the Spanish race, which was preeminently a race of gold seekers, was in full and undisputed possession of California for a period of four score years without making the discovery that it was the richest gold-bearing region that has ever been known on the face of the earth. In other words, the same people that had penetrated to the farthest recesses of South America in search of gold, which they took away with them to Spain by the shipload, and the same people that had wrung from the Incas of Peru and the Montezumas of Mexico untold treasures, possessed the hills and the valleys of a far richer country for more than three quarters of a century without ever knowing that there lay shining at the bottom of the streams and locked in the bosom of the mountains of California a wealth of gold that was to make the wealth of the Aztecs appear paltry and insignificant. Even as the Bay of San Francisco was destined to be discovered by a landsman and not by a mariner, as would seem natural, so it was destined that gold in California was to be discovered not by a Spaniard, nor the son of a Spaniard, who with his people before him had long occupied California, but by an American who was neither a prospector nor a miner, but an everyday working millwright. It has been authenticated that gold has been discovered in California prior to 1848, but the discovery was unimportant without results. It remained for James W. Marshall, a native of New Jersey and a Californian by choice and adoption, to make the discovery in January 1848, which set the whole civilized world on fire with excitement. The historic spot was on the South Fork of the American River, where the present little town of Coloma in El Dorado County now stands. The spot is permanently marked by a magnificent towering monument capped by a lifelike sculptured figure of Marshall, the discoverer. The incidents which led up to Marshall's presence at Coloma are interesting as well as important. Marshall was a good timberman and well informed as to milling operations. Owing to his skill in these matters, he found employment in California with Captain John A. Sutter, a Swiss but a naturalized citizen of the Republic of Mexico. Captain Sutter owned large land grants from the Mexican government, and he was a sterling man of great business capacity and enterprise. He built a fort, which was located within the present municipality of Sacramento, the capital of California, a short distance from which he operated a flouring mill. He also engaged in an extensive scale in lumbering and agriculture, securing from his fields large harvests for his mill. The fort was for the protection of himself and family, his employees, and the residents of the place generally against the Indians. The Bear Flag War and the Mexican War considerably upset Sutter's business, but in August 1847 he nevertheless determined to make some expansion. With his keen foresight, he saw that peace would inevitably arrive and that with it, there would come a great many new people to California. To enlarge his business, to meet the demands that he knew would be made upon it, he arranged for new operations. Consequently, Sutter entered into a partnership with Marshall for a sawmill to be built on the South Fork of the American River. According to the agreement, Marshall was to select the site for the mill and to operate it for one-fourth of the lumber. The capital was furnished by Sutter, and it was further agreed between the two men that if the war should end in favor of Mexico, the whole ownership of the property was to divert to Sutter because of his citizenship in the Mexican Republic. But if, on the contrary, the war were to end in favor of the United States, Marshall, as an American citizen, should become sole owner. It appears that Marshall favored the location of the new mill on Butte Creek in the present county of Butte, but Samuel Kybers, Sutter's outside foreman, prevailed upon his employer to locate the new enterprise at Coloma. Marshall and Kybers, accompanied by a German millwright named Gingery and a few Indian laborers, began work at Coloma during the summer. With the approach of winter, they had erected a double log cabin in which to live. To this cabin came Peter L. Wimmer, his wife and family, Wimmer was to work at the mill, and Mrs. Wimmer was to cook for the men. Upon her arrival, she found Marshall very ill, and she immediately proceeded to nurse him back to health. At the close of December 1847, the mill was thought to be ready for operations, but a trial brought out the fact that the mill wheel was not properly placed, and the deepening of the tail race became necessary. In order to accomplish this necessary greater depth, the Indians were directed to pick out the large rocks during the daytime. The water, which had been dammed, was released at night in order to sluice out the earth. During this process, the first little handful of gold that awakened a whole world to an intense state of excitement was discovered in the now historic mill race at Coloma. 
There's plenty of evidence to prove that James W. Marshall was a rather erratic man and that his memory for facts was not the best in the world. Many contradictory statements have been made regarding his discovery, Marshall even contradicting himself on several occasions. Fortunately, however, very sufficient unassailable testimony exists to prove that Marshall is entitled to the honor which must remain his till the end of time. Mrs. Jane Wimmer, the good woman who cooked for the men at the mill and who nursed Marshall back to life from his serious illness, made at one time an authoritative statement in regard to the discovery, the truth of which is not doubted. Work on the mill race, dam, and mill had been going on for about six months, said Mrs. Wimmer, when one morning along the last days of December 1847 or the first week of January 1848 the discovery was made. Mr. Marshall and Mr. Wimmer went down to see what had been done while Mr. Marshall had been away at Southern Ports. The water was entirely shut off from the tail race, and as they walked along, talking and examining the work, just ahead of them on a little rough, muddy rock lay something looking bright like gold. They both saw it, but Mr. Marshall was the first to pick it up, and as he looked at it, doubted its being gold. Our little son Martin was along with them, and Marshall gave it to him to bring up to me. He came in a hurry and said, Here, mother, here's something that Mr. Marshall and Pa found, and they want you to put it in Celeritus water and see if it will tarnish. I said, This is gold, and I will throw it into my lye kettle, which I had just tried with a feather. And if it is gold, it will be gold when it comes out. At the breakfast table, one of the work hands raised his head from eating and said, I heard something about gold being discovered. What about it? Mr. Marshall told him to ask Jenny, and I told him it was in my soap kettle. Mr. Marshall said it was there if it had not gone back to California. A plank was brought to me to lay my soap onto, and I cut it into chunks, but it was not to be found. At the bottom of the kettle was a double handful of potash, which I lifted in my two hands, and there was my gold as bright as it could be. Mr. Marshall still contended that it was not gold, but whether he was afraid his men would leave him or really thought so, I don't know. Mrs. Wimmer was a Georgia woman and had seen gold mined in her native state, which accounts for her display of knowledge on the historic occasion of Marshall's discovery. On January 28, 1848, Marshall appeared at Sutter's Fort and in an excited manner demanded a private audience with Captain Sutter. The audience was cheerfully and promptly granted and the account of what then transpired has been told in Sutter's own words. Marshall asked me if the door was locked, said Captain Sutter. I said, no, but I will lock it. He was a singular man, and I took this to be some freak of his. I was not in the least afraid of him. I had no weapon. There was no gun in the room. I only supposed, as he was queer, that he took his, this queer way to tell me some secret. He first said to me, are we alone? I replied, yes, I want two bowls of water, said he. The bowls of water were brought. Now I want a stick of redwood, said Marshall, and some twine and some sheet copper. What do you want of these things, Marshall, said I. I want to make some scales, he replied, but I have scales enough in the apothecary's shop, said I. I did not think of that, said Marshall. I went myself and got some scales. When I returned with the scales, I shut the door, but did not lock it again. Then Marshall pulled out of his pocket a white cotton rag, which contained something rolled up in it. Just as he was unfolding it to show me the contents, the door was opened by a clerk passing through who did not know that we were in the room. There, exclaimed Marshall, did I not tell you we had listeners? I appeased him, ordered the clerk to retire and watch the door. Then he brought out his mysterious secret again, opening the cloth. He held it before me in his hand. It contained what might have been about an ounce and a half of gold dust, flaky and in grains, the largest piece not quite as large as a pea, and from that down to less than a pinhead in size. I believe this is gold, said Marshall, but the people at the mill laughed at me and called me crazy. I carefully examined it and said to him, well, it looks so. We will try it. Then I went down to the apothecary shop and got some aqua fortis and applied it. The stuff stood the test. Marshall then asked me if I had any silver. I said yes and produced a few dollars. Then we put an equal weight of gold in one side and silver in the other, and dropping the two in bowls of water, the gold went down and outweighed the silver underwater. Then I brought out a volume of an old encyclopedia, a copy of which I happened to have, to see what other tests there were. Then I said to him, I believe this is the finest kind of gold. The fact that Captain Sutter kept a careful diary of events and that he was a man of great reliability of character render his account of Marshall's visit entirely trustworthy. 
Sutter's diary and those kept by Henry W. Bigler and Azariah Smith fix the date of Marshall's discovery of gold at Coloma as having been January 24, 1848. Marshall remained over at the fort on the night of January 29th, returning next day to Coloma. Upon his arrival at the mill, he exacted a promise from the Indians and the white men there that they would keep the discovery secret for a period of six weeks until a new flour mill then under construction could be completed. But of course, the promise was not kept. The men at the mill could not restrain their excitement and eagerness, and immediately the great news fled down the ripples of the American River, taking California by the ears and spreading like a wildfire into all the highways and byways of the world. In the great rush for wealth which ensued, and out of which, during the first short five years of its existence, $1,200,000,000 in California gold was flung into the coffers of the world. A natural curiosity will arise to learn what becomes of James Wilson Marshall, the Jerseyman who started it all going. It is a pathetic story. Standing there with the wealth of the new El Dorado at his feet, and before the mighty hosts that were coming across land and sea to put eager hands upon it were able to arrive, Marshall's opportunity to amass immeasurable wealth in an incredibly short space of time was greater than any man ever had before in the history of the world. He made a good start by putting a number of white men and Indians at work for him digging out gold here and there and paying him large tribute. Even when the creeks and benches were covered with miners, he still remained in possession of two legal claims which were alone sufficient to make him very wealthy. But instead of attending to his own business, he took the queer notion in his head that nobody had a right to dig gold in California without his consent. So he went about from place to place, interfering with all whom he met, until finally he lost everything he had except his old cabin at Coloma. Here in later years, he planted vines and for a while conducted a successful vineyard, but his erratic habits again mastered him, and worse than all, he became an habitual inebriate. About the year 1870, he went on a lecturing tour from which he realized very handsome returns, all of which he squandered in drink and upon the human parasites who steadfastly fastened themselves upon him. From 1872 to 1876, he was in receipt of an appropriation from the state legislature sufficient to keep him in comfort. Ultimately, this appropriation was cut off. In the later years of his life, he became a common sot and a charge upon the charity of the community where he existed. Like the salmon to its native waters, Marshall drifted back at last to the scene that made his name immortal. There in his squalid cabin, one day they found him dead, lying fully dressed on his miserable couch, his hat pulled over his eyes, Thus died the man who had stood one fateful hour basking in the full sun of fortune, a darling of the gods, with a golden sword that was all his own spread around him. It is astonishing with what rapidity the news of the discovery of gold in California spread to all quarters of the globe, especially when we consider the fact that the means for the dissemination of news in the year 1849 were really very crude and inefficient. But the fact remains that the word traveled practically everywhere in an astoundingly short space of time, and that the effect of it all was to set in motion a migration which seems to be without parallel in history. Not only was every available sailing vessel on the Atlantic seaboard of America chartered and overloaded with passengers headed for the gold fields, but the harbor of San Francisco soon beheld also within its portals ship after ship from every sea in all parts of the earth. And while it is true that the hosts which came were composed largely of Americans, the muddy streets and hillsides of the old mission town of Yerba Buena were colorful with the Oriental stranger, the Celt, the Teuton, the yellow-haired Scandinavian, and men of every race and clime. Then ensued a wild free-handed life that was without precedent to guide it, and that, when it passed at last, vanished to return no more. The farmer boys of New England and of the eastern states, the clerk, the lawyer, and even the adventurous clergyman found themselves suddenly relieved from the staid provincial restriction which had hedged them in from birth. They had left their mothers, sisters, and sweethearts behind them. Sunday came, and the bell of the meeting house no longer rang in their ears. The few women that the exodus had gathered with it were bedizened and painted and not the best company for unsophisticated villagers for the first time set free from a century of accumulated decency. Yet it is to the great credit of these men that of themselves they soon established rude but effective law and order, 
out of the chaos in which they found themselves. Without the authority of government to uphold them, they made it obligatory upon the thief to keep his hands in his own pocket and the murderer to stay his bloody hands in fear and dread of the summary vengeance that was sure to be visited on him. These men, with the traditions of generations strong upon them, came soon to establish a code for the guidance of themselves and others, which, while it left the gambler free to ply his avocation, still compelled him to deal square, and it came to pass that the miner in the diggings could leave his cabin unlocked by day or night to find his store of gold dust untouched and safe upon his return.